Recent events has made this rare its head again within the MMA community. And that is Alana McLaughlin, previously a male, transitioned into a female, is now a transgender woman competing against a biological woman within MMA. Now this isn't new to MMA. Fallon Fox did this back in 2014, where she was a transgender woman competing against biological females. Now this has brought out people on both sides of the camp. We have one side stating that this is fine, that transgender woman identify as a woman, they've gone through all the requisite hormone treatment and everything else they need to do to compete against women. Whereas we have another side stating that this shouldn't be allowed whatsoever. So is it fair for transgender females to compete against biological females? Hey everyone, James here from Sweet Science of Fighting. If you find this video informative, you learn something new, please give it a like and subscribe to my channel. It's gonna help the YouTube algorithm gods get this video out to more people. If you read any of the views all over social media or the internet, you often find it's just a spewing of emotional diatribe. It's very rarely grounded in science. It's more of an opinion or people's opinion on what people should do and without any real reasoning behind their ideologies. Now, I want to preface this video with the fact that it's not gonna be an emotional breakdown of whether or not a transgender woman should compete against other women in MMA or even in any sport. This is gonna be purely scientific breakdown and I'm gonna to come to a conclusion at the end based on the evidence we have. Also, this video is only gonna focus on transgender women, that is a male transitioning to a female to compete against biological females. The reverse where we have biological females transitioning to a male and competing in male sports is very rare and it's very rare to see that even at a high level as well and you may see why throughout this video. So let's start with the four main reasons that are often brought up where to support the idea of transgender women competing against other biological women. Firstly, we have that sport is unfair. Secondly, we have that gender is just a social construct, so there's no difference between males and females anyway. Thirdly, we have they undergo hormone treatment, so they have hormone levels similar to a biological female, and because they had to have their hormones reduced, they come in at a disadvantage. And then finally, we have the argument that, well, they're not gonna win medals, so they're not gonna win anyway, so why does it matter? And I'm gonna break down each of these arguments individually. So let's start with sport is unfair. And we know this, deep down we know sport is not fair. We know you at home, if you're a, not a professional athlete, maybe you didn't make it because you're short, you're tall, you didn't have the talent, you didn't have the resources to be able to seek out the best coaches, you didn't have economic background to be able to spend a lot of time training your sport. There are so many different factors that go into making an elite athlete or a high level athlete that it is unfair. For example, I'm five foot eight. I'm not gonna make it as a professional basketball player, even though I don't have the skills anyway. But even if I did, it would be very unlikely for me to make the NBA just because of my height. The same thing goes for the NFL. I'm not gonna make an, the NFL, even if I had the skill, I don't have that size to be able to, to play there. And this is what we call tolerable unfairness. The idea of tolerable unfairness is grounded in the idea that all athletes start from relatively the same starting point. And that would be, for example, starting as a male or starting as a female. But in the end, they end up at different paths within the athletic career due to uncontrollable factors. And that is why we love the underdog. The underdog is someone who started at relatively the same starting position, being born as a male or female, but due to their circumstances, for example, they might not have the money back in them. They may not have the coaches or the access to the facilities. They may not have had the money, but they still made it to the professional or the highest level. And that is why we always root for the underdog because they were able to overcome these barriers. While tolerable unfairness is uncontrolled, there is some tolerable unfairness that is controlled. For example, within swimming, we have the wetsuits that allow faster times in the water to be banned. And that is so that skill can be the deciding factor of who wins the competition. And that is the purpose of competitive sport. Just like an MMA, we want to know who is the most skillful mixed martial arts. And that is why we have weight classes, not just sex or gender divisions. We have a male and female division, but we also have within those weight classes. And the reason for the weight classes is to create fair competition. If you put a heavyweight MMA fighter, for example, we take Steve Miocic and we put him against a flyweight, we're gonna see that the heavyweight is likely to win just because he is bigger, stronger, more powerful. In the end, we don't know who is the most skillful within that competition. So when we have a transgender woman fighting other biological women, we see that size strength advantage, which we're gonna cover later in the video, might overshadow the skill aspect. So within that competitive bout, 
we might see that the person who wins is not the most skillful, but rather they're just overpowered through their generally greater strength and size. And the advantage these transgender women have is not an uncontrollable factor. It's a controllable factor. And that's where I think many people run into finding this a problem within MMA because it's not something where they overcame a barrier as they were developing as an athlete. This is something where within their control, they've just they've changed their gender so they can compete in the women's division. Now remember, these are generalizations that apply to the on a population level. This is not saying that Alana McLaughlin or Fallon Fox were in fact bigger, stronger, more powerful. This is the idea that on average, we see these things happen. And we're gonna run through all those now as we go through the next three points. So our second reason that often comes up is that there's no real physical difference between males and females. Now I'm gonna pop this little graph on the screen now, and it essentially it's showing males versus females, best performances within each discipline or sport. And as you can see within this, you have about a 10 to 13% difference at the very low end, and that is males over females within mostly endurance sports. As you get up to the higher end, you get over 50% difference within the best performances between males and females, and this is usually power and strength sports. Now, it seems that the more the upper body is involved in these events, the greater the difference between males and females. This indicates that males are generally stronger, bigger, and faster than females. And even in the sport of weightlifting, if females are 60% heavier than the male, they still don't make up for the strength deficit. However, we're probably not gonna see elite level athletes transitioning from male to female to compete in female sports. Instead, we usually see the average Joe as they move as a semi-competitive male into women's division. So how does the average Joe, male and female, compare to each other? Bear with me as I read some of these statistics off my screen, just because there's a lot of numbers. But in youth adults, we see VO2 max values in males to be 56% higher than in females. And then we also see that males possess 89% greater 1RM strength, 57% greater muscle size, 109% greater isometric strength, and possess 162% more power than females. And we can go back even younger than youth adults. We can go to nine-year-olds. And nine-year-old males are generally 10% Ten percent further and do 33 percent more push-ups and they also have a 14 percent stronger grip than but it doesn't stop there we can go even younger we can go to six-year-old kids and six-year-old males are able to perform 16 percent more shuttle runs and jump 10 percent further than their six-year-old female counterparts specifically with an mma if we take a look at the ufc performance institute data from their first cross-sectional analysis we see that UFC bantamweight males have a 17% greater benchmark than female bantamweights when we look at vertical jump. We see a reactive strength shows an even greater discrepancy and we see a 33% difference between males and females. Now, within the strength values, we've seen maximum strength of world leading performance benchmarks within bantamweight males is 32% greater than females. And we see that VO2 max is 6.5% greater. So we can see a clear difference in physical quality between males and females when you're from a very young age to adult and even from amateur level all the way through to elite level sport. So what would happen if we just abolished a male and female division and just combined it all into one? Well, we'll probably see the end of females within sport. And here's why. So if we take the world record 100 meter sprint for a female, and that is 10.49 seconds. Let's look at the 100 meter record for the boys category, and that is under 16s, which is 10.15. Now, if you take the top five results just within that race, they all beat the women's world record 100 meter sprint. Now you may argue, okay, that's strength and power. We know that males seem to be as far greater strength and power than females, but what about the endurance side? Well, we can go the opposite end of the spectrum. We can look at marathon runners. And we see that the female marathon world record is two hours, 17 minutes and one second. Now the under 18 boys record for the marathon is two hours, 11 minutes and 43 seconds set by a 17 year old. Now, Ross Tucker, a sports scientist from South Africa, explains this best, and I'm gonna link his article in the description so you can go through that too. But he states that if you take males within a certain sport and gather those who are within the top 10 to 13% of the best performance. So remember that 
10 to 13 percent seems to be our lowest performance difference between males and females at the highest level so if we take just males that are within that 10 to 13 percent of the best performance and we brought them in to the women's category we would see that there'll be thousands of them that would fit and even if 10 percent of those thousands who weren't quite elite entered into the female competition, the very best female athletes would then be pushed outside of the top 100 and in some cases, even the top 1000. So we can see there's these large physical performance differences between males and females, but what is it that creates these performance differences? So let's talk about testosterone. Now, the argument usually comes that because transgender females have to reduce their testosterone down close to female level not to female levels that they're now at a disadvantage because they've had to reduce this hormone some will say that testosterone doesn't even play or have a role within athletic performance which is just mind-boggling there's a reason that countries spend millions of dollars on their state-sponsored doping programs but i digress so if we go into the science of testosterone we see that the iaaf which is the International Athletics Association. In 2019, they stated that to the best of their knowledge, there is no other genetic or biological trait encountered in female athletics that confers such a huge performance advantage than testosterone. The average male testosterone is anywhere between 7.7 .7 to around 29 nanomoles per liter. The average female range is from zero to 1.7. Now, the guidelines or the thresholds for testosterone to compete in an Olympic event is 10 nanomoles per liter, which is almost 10 times the amount of a normal female. Within athletics, they've lowered it down to five, but that's still at least five times the average female. Now, I don't know what were the thresholds within this MMA organization or even when Fallon Fox competed. I'm pretty sure that these organizations literally have no clue what they're doing and there probably wasn't even a testosterone threshold. But even if these fighters met these testosterone thresholds or even met the, fee the biological female threshold, they still confer an advantage. And I'm gonna show you why. But firstly, let's look at how raising testosterone in a biological female affects their performance. Now, we're talking about raising it well outside of the normal biological range from around 1.7, which is the threshold, but raising it to around seven nanomoles per liter, which is within the range of being able to compete in the Olympics. Now we see 4.4% increases in muscle mass, 12 to 14% increases in lower body strength and power, and 26% increase in upper body power. And this is at a testosterone level that is 156% greater than the normal female and is on the low end of a biological male. In fact, when males hit puberty, we see testosterone levels increase 20x, whereas females remain the same. So we see a big 15 times difference between male testosterone and female testosterone through puberty. Even at the early to middle stages of puberty, we see males with an average testosterone of seven animals per liter, which is still much greater than the average female. Just from this, we can infer that the large performance gaps we see between males and females is down to testosterone and puberty. And we can see that when we actually inject exogenous testosterone, AKA steroids, we see huge, huge gains in muscle mass and strength and power in both males and females but females need a much smaller dose. For example, these graphs show a clear dose response relationship between the amount of testosterone taken a week and improvements in body composition, muscle strength, and muscle power. And this goes for both males and females, but the females didn't even take near what the males used. The males used up to 600 milligrams a week, whereas females only used up to 25 and still saw huge performance benefits. So what does all this extra testosterone actually do to the body? Well, firstly, we see that it has a very strong effect on bone density and males generally have 10% greater bone surface area compared to females. Now, greater bone surface area means that males can carry more muscle on their frames than females. Males are also on average seven to 8% taller than females with longer, denser and stronger bones. And this allows them greater leverage in activities such as jumping, throwing, and any other explosive task. But it doesn't stop there. Males have a diaphragm that sits lower and that gives them greater lung capacity. Further, they're able to pump 33% more blood per heartbeat than females. 
This is due to males having a larger heart. And not only that, males have a greater concentration of hemoglobin, which is able to carry the oxygen through the blood to the working muscles. So overall, we see that males have a huge advantage in overall aerobic conditioning. Okay, that's great. We see the big differences between males and females regarding physiology, physical strength and power and performance. But then if a transgender woman has testosterone suppressed, even down to female levels, wouldn't that then now mitigate all of these changes that they've gone through in their life. But let's take a look at what's been studied so far. So even after 24 months of hormone therapy, we see transgender women generally retain their bone density and in some cases may even preserve their bone density for over 12 years. After three years of hormone treatment, we only see a reduction of 12% in muscle mass. When we take this out to eight years of hormone treatment, we see that muscle mass is only reduced by 17%. Now, males generally have approximately 40% greater muscle mass than females. So a reduction of 17% is not substantial when we're talking about leveling the playing field. I mean, this 17% reduction still places them in the 90th percentile of the average female. We also see that grip strength is reduced by 25%, but that still places them 25% higher than the average female. Now, if we look at a very fast hormone therapy regime where we reduce testosterone down to the female level after a transition, we only see a reduction in grip strength of about 4%. So now we're talking in the 90 plus percentile of the average female, even though they've transitioned and the testosterone has been reduced into the female range. So if we take all this data into account, we see that transgender women retain most of the advantages they've gained from being a male throughout their life. Now, especially as they've gone through puberty, as they've had that surge of testosterone and they've had these physical and physiological changes happen. Now, transitioning before puberty, perhaps there might be less of a performance difference, but we still see, as mentioned earlier, six-year-olds and even nine-year-olds show a pretty big performance, uh, physical performance difference between them. Which brings me to the last argument, and that is, okay, transgender women, they may have all these advantages, but that doesn't mean they're gonna win, so who really cares? Now, this is a slippery slope when you start going down this road or this argument, and that is to allow transgender women to compete against biological women just because they might not win. Well, firstly, it's a matter of fairness, and I touched on fairness at the start of this video, but another thing with fairness is that the biological female isn't allowed to supplement with exogenous testosterone, or AKA steroids, to increase their testosterone level to meet the transgender woman's testosterone. If we add on the fact that the transgender woman has had testosterone all their life, has these adaptations to it, it's even a greater disadvantage now for the biological female who cannot use steroids or exogenous testosterone to meet the transgender woman. Further, when we look at this Alana McLaughlin and Fallon Fox incidents in isolation, we see, hey, it's only been two fighters in the whole history of the sport. so. It's not that big of a problem, but this is at the professional or high level MMA. The problem becomes now where, as it trickles down into the amateur divisions where, where most people are competing. There's only a handful of select people fighting at the top level where there are a lot more at the amateur level. And the problem becomes now, it sets a precedence for it to happen at the lower levels. For example, if we look at college wrestling, now this was a big thing maybe a few years ago now, the transgender woman, Mac Beggs. Now she was an American high school wrestler. She won the Texas State girls wrestling championship two years in a row and a combined record was 89 and 0. Now the problem at this amateur level is that the average male that transitions can potentially compete at a much higher level within the female division and this sets off almost like a butterfly effect or a cascade. Now this transgender woman is competing against biological females, beating biological females and these biological females that could potentially make it or be picked for a representative side or make it to the national level don't because someone else has taken their spot due to a potentially unfair advantage so these females female athletes don't make the teams get beat up whatever it is and they end up quitting the sport missing out on sponsorships missing out on whatever while I'm not saying this has happened specifically with these incidences at the amateur level there's the potential to happen especially in the future as more and more transgender women are starting to compete within female sports so to answer the question once and for all should transgender women compete in women's MMA and I believe no, they shouldn't. And that's just based on the evidence that I presented throughout this video. Now, MMA is a completely different sport compared to say, running or an endurance sport. And even then I still don't believe they should compete there because they still have an advantage. But within MMA, you have health reasons as well. You have someone who is generally 
physically bigger, strong, and faster, punching, kicking, grappling, biological female who is at a disadvantage due to not having testosterone. And this doesn't just equal wins and losses, this can equal hospitalizations and it could eventually potentially result in death. Now I'm not saying that this is gonna happen and you know, that death and whatever is gonna be the outcome for the next fight that happens like this, but it's definitely a possibility, especially when you have such a big size advantage. The same, you would see the same thing if you saw a heavyweight fighting a bantamweight. That size difference is just too much of an advantage. You've probably felt it yourself within your own combat sports training. If you've been striking or grappling for a while and you've had to go out spar with someone in class who is much bigger than you, you know you're in for a rough time. It's gonna be harder for you if you're grappling to get out of the bottom position, you wanna be on top as much as possible so you don't get crushed within striking. You're finding someone who hits generally harder just because they have more mass. And that's just the, the reality of it. There's just no good outcome of transgender women competing against other biological women within MMA. I mean, you see Fallon Fox apparently broke Tamika Brent's, her opponent's skull within her last fight. Now, Fallon Fox has lost an MMA fight in her professional career. And that's one of the arguments that people make that, hey, you know, maybe that performance advantage doesn't exist. But we know from the research, from the things I presented now, there is a huge performance gap, one. And two, elite level sport or high level sport, it's more than just physical performance advantages. We know there's a big skill component to it as well. And there's more factors than that. How you come into the cage, are you adequately prepared? How is your mental state? Your mental state obviously plays a role in this too. So there are so many different factors and just to pin it down to the fact that she lost a fight, so she doesn't have an advantage is too short sighted. Is there a solution for transgender women to compete within sports like MMA? Honestly, at this time, I don't know. I don't think there's enough transgender women to create, say, a transgender woman division, which many people also call for. And the fact that it probably wouldn't get funded anyway, just due to there won't be as many people viewing it compared to, say, male and female MMA. So I don't know if that would even take off. And then the fact that you've also got the social justice side and the emotional side, trying to cancel anyone that has a video or any content that goes against this. So if I get canceled guys, you know why. If you check the description, I've got a blog post version of this. It might be a little easier to go through and see some of the statistics within there and some of the research. I've referenced everything within that article so you can check it out for yourself. Also, please like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video. Feel free to comment on this video too, whether you agree or disagree. I'm more than happy to see both sides. I'm very objective with this. I didn't want to put too much of an emotional stance on it. I know for me, based on the research that I've read and seen, I don't agree with transgender women competing against biological women. And I know there's a few people that do agree with me, but I know there's probably a lot that don't. So I'd love to hear it in the comments, whether good or bad.